Jesus is one of the most radical and revolutionary figures in any religion because of his adherence, not to law, not to his adherence to religious indoctrination or ceremony, but in his absolutely adherence to love for his fellow human being. I get chills thinking about it because it is such a monumental task to even attempt to love human beings in that way. Welcome to Ye Gods. I'm Scott Carter. My guest today is my friend, Michael Render, also known as Killer Mike. He's a Grammy-winning hip-hop artist, one half of Run the Jewels, Billboard Magazine's first-ever recipient of the Changemaker Award, and an entrepreneur in his beloved Atlanta. Soon, he will be dropping his second solo album, Michael, and he and I are also co-creators and producers of Love and Respect with Killer Mike on PBS. Michael, it is always a delight to talk to you because I know by the end of the conversation, if not before, I will have a big smile on my face. What's up? It's second solo album in 10 years. I, I don't want to think I've been lazy. I've been in the game 20 years. But you have also been busy. Yeah. Other than a solo album, you will also have another collaborator with whom you work, and you've done four RTJ albums, and you're working on the fifth. That's the goal. And so we look forward to seeing that. One of the things I want to get to today is to ask you about what was religion like in your household as you were growing up, in your home? What was, was, was it ever present? Yeah, it was always there. <laughs> my grandmother is from Tuskegee, Alabama. Damn. My grandmother was just, she loved the Lord, like she'd tell you, you know. And my grandfather was very distant with religion, but was a believer in God. So my grandmother was who we went to church with, and... We belong to a Baptist church. So I, I believe she was may have been raised Methodist because they were educated because they went to a Methodist school. But I, my she was Baptist or joined a Baptist church when she got to Atlanta, Georgia. And it was um, it was a good experience. Like it was a big church for, you know, comparatively speaking for churches. There weren't a lot of mega churches at the time. It was Mount Olive Baptist Church. It, the, the minister lived in our community, in the Collier Heights community. She'd take us to these small little storefront, a little house, almost like Pentecostal churches. And the, the music was just, man, the music was just amazing. And that's what I loved about it. <laughs> and I felt myself more in community with those churches. Some of those churches were on the same streets because this is the time as if the crack epidemic is starting. It was the same streets you would see kind of deteriorate into a misery and hopelessness, you know, due to addiction, unfortunately. But those churches were the, were the hope in those communities. And you formed a community, you know, around them. And the music was just so damn good, you know, because the same musicians that would be. And this is like in the 80s where everybody wanted, like, you know, kids out there don't listen to adults and say everybody wants to be a rapper because everybody wanted to play guitar and be in a band. You know what I mean? So this is when everybody was playing an instrument of some sorts, the older kids. So the same guys that would be playing in clubs the night before that my mom would go to. As a young woman, they would be playing in church the next morning. So it was a funk and a groove to church music that I loved. So what? So how is there a, a, a choir? Is there a big choir? How yes. many? How many musicians would be performing? Guitar, basses, drummer, and then you'd have you you either have um, you'd have some some small churches would have a full choir, but we, which would mean eight to twelve people. Some would only have two or three singers, and oftentimes. The pastors at these churches were electric spokespeople, but they could carry a tune, too. So you're looking at about a four or five piece man and, and anywhere from three to, uh, you know, seven, eight voices. And they would just put on a show. And then um, in these small rooms, if you're a musician, it's like a small room, but you're intimate almost with it. And it, it would just cause a, a fervor of sorts. And people get into it and then people experience catching the Holy Ghost. It would just be these um you know, the closest I've come to that feeling is doing psychedelics, you know, doing mushrooms and smoking. Okay, so when you're young, if you're eight, nine years old, are you on the same page as as your grandmother <laughs> with religion at that time? Or or is it just the music? It was just the music. Besides the fact she's making you yeah, go. Yeah. 
what's keeping you there? Well, it's the the music is a big part of it. The music is a big part of it. It also was this red haired girl with freckles, and um, I ended up marrying a red hair with freckles. So I think that just I <laughs> I think that was our Achilles heel too. But the, it was it was the music and it was the message in the teaching style of like Sister Mary Jackson, Bethlehem Healing Temple. Her teaching style was very much one that was not preaching and showman like, but it was a address the, com- the church community while almost sitting. You know, she'd be a podium up, but be sitting and be talking to you and educating you on the lesson that she would teach about the prophet or Jesus or the person and why and why it mattered. And then she'd bring in guest preachers who would, you know, get everything riled up. But she really was a teacher down to even maybe my sisters would work in a garden with her. Like she, every step of the way would teach us, you know. And then you had Bishop Jean, who also was a woman pastor. And initially my grandmother liked going to these smaller churches that were led by women pastors. She had an exciting voice. I'll never forget. She had a gold t- tooth. She would wear red, which is what was looked down upon by some, you know, holding this Pentecostal church is wearing white and being, you know, very modest matters. But she was exciting and she was electric and her talk about Jesus, both talk in Jesus about in radical ways. <clears throat> One was was pretty subdued and taught in a, in a you know a very um it forced you to ask questions and kind of come to conclusions yourself. And the other taught in a way that was very dynamic and direct, and saying that Jesus was challenging authority. And they are, I think, what captivated me about the character of Jesus. So that they, because I realized what they were saying was not what was being said at Mount Olive. That did, what, what was being said at Mount Olive wasn't important, but it was not about a radical that was pushing back against the system or even a radical that saw love for your fellow human being as a more important conquest than conquering the minds of things. What was the prime notion of radicalism about Jesus that most impressed you? The ability to love those who you know don't love you, the ability to work with those who were formerly persecute you and Saul becoming Paul, the ability to sit next to those who know you will betray you and have the power to end that, and the ability to sit down and reckon with your direct opposer. And I think lastly, and what really hooked me was, was when he spans the temple because it was in, in a direct opposition to government and to religion, you know, the government of religion, the governance of man, and you know, the, the church becoming a marketplace. And I think that's because that's what reminded me of Martin and Malcolm. And that's what reminded me of the work that my grandmother and my grandfather did. They weren't flamboyant in their, in their charity. They, it was just their duty to make sure that if we ate fish, our neighbors had fish to eat as well. It was, it, my grandmother wasn't flamboyant in her love and servitude to people that didn't understand her. But when I found letters that a white woman who was formerly, they used my grandmother's family as sharecroppers, that my grandmother showed her grace and mercy and empathy and the woman was thanking her. That's when I understood that the love of Jesus is a radically different, you know, thing. So I saw it exercise in those ways. But Jesus as a character is, is one of the most powerful revolutionary examples in my life. It's what ultimately gives me faith in humanity. I know you told me one time that your favorite Jesus quote was John 13, 34, a new commandment I give you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love yes. one another. I love this quote because it is a command. It is not a suggestion. He said, a new command I give you. A command is an order. It is a demand. It is a directive. Um, Jesus was unflinching in that unflinching and love one another, not unflinching and you must belong to this tribe or this, this, this social group of class, not unflinching in that you must follow these rules and must pray these many times a day, but unflinching is that you must love one another, not love according to the ceiling that you have on love or love according to the rules that you have. You must love one another as, as, as I have loved you, as I have loved you. Okay. And, and that's, a, that's a love I am attempting to understand and enable myself to, because I'm not there, but it is a journey that I, that I'm gladly on. How do you progressively get closer to uh, that? If I could figure out that, you know, that love, you know, if we search more for that 
and less for things that make us feel as though we're right, you know, or our dogma is right, I think we'll be on the path. Like, I don't practice an Abrahamic religion, but I've learned from them all. I study them all, and, and I believe that the origin of them is, you know, I believe that they're that, that the God of Abraham, so the monothe monotheistic uh, ideal of God, I believe it's, it's, it's real. I believe God is real. But I don't always believe in anything after this. Now, I actually kind of share a lot of that because um, when I was in the womb, I had no idea of the world that I was going to be coming into. So why do I think if there is a world beyond this one, why do I think that my imagination or my intellect could accurately predict what that next dimension is going to be like? Yeah. So then I'm completely focused here and, and, and trying to be focused on if there is, if there's a God, if there is a loving God, what does that God want of me now? And then how best can I serve it? And then also, I think, God the manufacturer understands the frailty of some of the products yeah. that he puts out. <laughs> and, and, and when you said you're not perfect yet and you're not there yet, but you're on the journey and this is where you're trying to go, I think a benevolent God gets that. Yeah. And so I don't also respond to as many people whose notion of religion is more about hell, yeah, the threat of hell. One of the guests on this show a couple of weeks ago said that he was taught in his parochial school that when he sinned as a child, he was making God mad. Can you imagine <laughs> if you're seven years old and you... You tell a fib or whatever, or you take something from your uh, one of your brothers or sisters or something that God is up in heaven hitting his forehead yeah, and rolling his eyes and vowing vengeance <laughs> on this seven-year-old. Um, I think also when you and I have talked about your, your grandfather, that he believed in God strongly, but did not believe in supporting religious institutions. Yeah. And and I think that I think you and I and your grandfather. I, th I think we share three things. One is a belief in God. Absolutely. Second, love of Jesus. Absolutely. And then third is the distrust, the healthy skepticism yeah. of, of, of an organized institution, which at the end of the day is made by men and women, yeah. and it's going to be fallible. Yeah, absolutely. And he, it's going to be disappointing if we're looking to it to be perfect. Yeah, yeah. I, I, he, he, you know, he taught me a lot easily. That was my man. He, um, Willie Burke Shirley. But I think that he had a very beautiful way of teaching me that life is not fair. Like, like you said, I remember saying to him one time, you know, that ain't fair. Him looking at me just as sweet as me. Boy, life ain't fair. And not that it was good or bad. It just is. Life is filled with suffering and troubles. And that doesn't mean you're suffering and have trouble every day. But boy, on the days it hits you, it hits you. But you have to accept that that is a part of life. And the beauty of, the absolute beauty of life is, is being or having the opportunity to live, as, as they would say in church, live the word. My grandfather, I never saw in our church until he died. Mm. My grandfather did the work of the Lord in the streets every day. Whether well, it was picking someone up who he saw walking who had a flat tire or taking time to help change that flat tire or um, making sure when we fished that we always had enough of the older people who were in our community. You know what I mean? To, to making sure that the children who weren't um, as well off in the family, whose parents might have been dealing with some issues, that they got an opportunity to vacation. And see, and he didn't have much. You know, he was a dump truck driver. His wife was a nurse. But they were constantly in help and in support of, you know what I'm saying? I don't know what happens, but, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I, but I, but I know that I have an opportunity while I'm here to transfer the energy of good and service and servitude to my fellow human being that I got from my grandparents that me and my sisters got, I have an opportunity to teach it to my children and others before I get out of here. So the energy, never dies. So I know that in that way, we're immortal. 
Okay, so you mentioned a minute ago the Abrahamic traditions. Was there a time when you're still going with your family to church, purely Christian? What makes you then want to look at other religions? And then how long does it take you to unify that vision? Well, my grandmother works for a lot of Jewish people in terms of she was a nurse and she would be in the nursing homes, uh, house Jewish people. And it, it was another type of specialized, but one was like specifically for you know, older Jewish people. And you start asking questions because I'm a kid. Like, like they say, our religion came from you guys. What's the Torah? What's Abraham? You guys. And, and, and to be honest, man, old people just enjoy being engaged. So they were very open and forthcoming. And they would explain to me what different high holy holidays meant. And I'd say, well, in church, they taught us this about it. And they, you know, some things that were not the, the same, they teach and correct. And so I enjoyed engaging about it because as a Christian, you learn that these are your origins. So I've always been into history and want to know why. Why so I found, and at the time, hip hop was very married to what would be considered like a sect of, of Islam. So I got interested in Islam. And then in the Quran, my father gave me a Quran. And, and how old are you at this, at this time? time I'm, I'm 15 years old. 15, And I was amazed. Because I was like, you studied this before? Because my dad wasn't as in the church too, but I know he had been raised Christian. This is my I have two fathers. This is Mike, uh, Big Mike. And um, he's like, yeah. He's like, you know, I saw you interested in it, so I wanted to give you this. And um, Jesus was mentioned more in there. <laughs> Bible. I was like, wow, this, this dude got around. Like, And he made such an impression that I understood that, you know, when Ishmael and Isaac and that controversy and stuff, that all these traditions and people are interconnected. Now, I don't know why polit politically don't, they don't get along. I don't know why, you know, religiously and culturally don't get along, but they, they all are connected from this. I, so I just started to kind of, I studied Islam for a while. I did practice. Um, and I remember telling my mom, like, I'm just, I'm, I don't believe I can honestly be a believer in any other system. He was, you know, just say, you know, you have a talent, you have a, you, you definitely have a, you have a good soul. You want it to be close to God. I say, yeah, but it all just leads you back to a white man in a dress. Maybe that was, <laughs> maybe that was me to say, you know, I just, I just, I didn't find me because that, as a black child in America, you're growing up in hip hop, new thing is growing. Blacks are kind of asserting. And, and this happens every 20 year cycle. Every kid thinks they're asserting itself. Breaks on new. So part of that just naturally just being a young person in America, but compounded with being black, you were looking for yourself. That's why I say, you know, Black History Month is important for all people, not just for black people, because all people are participating in history. And it's important, you know, we were there, too, because that makes us more human. So when I'm looking at religion and I'm not seeing myself, when I'm looking at when I'm hearing stories and I'm not understanding that many of these stories, these folklore, these fables that have gone and started the Abrahamic religions come right out of the Horn of Eastern Africa. And they come out of the, the South, the South Sudan and Ethiopia. They they come from people who look like me. And had I known, had I known that the faith that I had and have would have been even stronger because I would have connected in a way that I didn't feel like a foreigner. So image does not matter as much to me now in the lessons that I learned, but image will always have to matter in that I have to make sure black children look in the mirror and understand that God is on the other side inside what they're looking at that reverend ike who my grandfather despised was giving lessons in the late 70s early 80s about manifestation and looking for god inside and almost meditating and my grandmother got it and my, my wife showed me after my grandmother died my grandmother had books on meditation books on scripture she i always thought she was adherent only to the bible but what I didn't understand is she, like me, had been on a journey to find a deeper level of understanding of God. And she exercised it through Christianity because it was easiest to. And not all, you know, I remember coming back from church with Miss Ophelia, who's a Catholic lady who lives up the street. And I'm in an all black neighborhood, just a preface so people know. So I got black Muslims, I got black Catholics, Pentecostal, all this is in this neighborhood. So I go to the Catholic church in Miss Ophelia, black Catholic church, not even seven minutes from my house, go down. Come back after 30 minutes, tell my grandma the church is over. I'm going to be Catholic. That's just 30 minutes. I'm witness. She never lets me go back. <laughs> 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 Ever. You know what I mean? 
<laughs> but I, I just say that because I realized she was on a journey herself to get a deeper understanding of, of God and to see God, to see the divinity in herself. And I think she found that because as she got older, she still went to church a lot, was still a diehard believer in it. But she talked about love and self-love and expressing it. It's interesting when you talk about her journey and her investigation, as you did, of other religions besides the one that you were practicing or the one that you've been raised in, gives you perspective in the same way that if you have lived in, in, in one city or one state all of your life and then you go travel. When you come back home, you have a different appreciation of what your home is because you know what your home is not. Yeah. And she did. She, um, I married a woman very much like, you know, I thought about, I don't know if I've ever told Shane this, but she dressed my grandmother and my mother, her and my sister for their, for their burials. And, you know, my mother for a presentation and she actually cremated. But what a task it must have been to have to dress Jesus is about to be friends and loved ones. And my grandmother did that so often. I've had to really think and meditate on her the last months because we've had like seven back-to-back steps of people that were relatively or deeply close to us. And it has caused me to have to be stoic in terms of showing up and speaking at a few of those and my wife to have to be very much like my grandmother and help me navigate the grieving process and how do you console people. So I just realized being a, being my grandmother, being a Christian, was the system that she would best be able to exercise her commitment to love of fellow human beings as commanded by her Christ. How have the losses that you've had to endure, what have you learned from them, and how does that impact each day of your life differently? Well, I don't know individually what I've learned, because, you know, it's, it's, it's not like it hits you in the gut and you instantly learn. You have to process, go back over, why do I feel like this? What is this? You know, what is this? But I think more than anything that every single day is precious. So let me treat the day and the people in my in the day in the best way I possibly can. The music you you've described music throughout this conversation as being important to you, especially in a church. Is there a particular hymn that resonates the most for you? I'm gonna sling low sleep chariot was my grandfather. It is a expectation that God is going to take care of me, that there's a reward in death. Not the reward if I get a big house on the other side or I get to be my father, but the reward that I will be comforted for the work I've done and I get to be with my God again. That's pretty dope. I want to. I just got a couple more things I want to ask you about. Oh. Uh, one of them is the new album that's coming out is called Michael. And I loved that title because I've always called, I I think the first time, one of the first times I met you, I said, what do you like to be called? And you said, well, the people who raised me call me Michael. Yeah. And I said, well, then I'm going to call you, then I'm going to call you Michael. (laughs) And, And so I thought that this album, which I've heard parts of now, and I can't wait before the world hears it. It's an origin story. It is, it, it is a story that places you in, in the same kind of context you've been able to paint for yourself by talking about how you were raised. It's a very, very strong statement. Thank you. So tell me about picking the name Michael for the album. And I also want to know, do you in your mind have a difference between, well, that's Killer Mike and this is Michael Render? I, yeah, well, Killer Mike is a character created by a kid named Michael Render to exercise badass poetry through hip hop and killer Mike <laughs> killer Mike is, is an amazing character to exercise my love of hip hop. Um, cause hip hop is kind of like pugilistic poetry. So imagine mixing the last poets with Muhammad Ali. It's a desire to win. You know, that's what you want. You know, Michael render though, is somebody who the world doesn't really know. They, they probably got started to get to meet around 2016. Maybe Michael render is a kid who was had by two teenage kids raised by the, the girls, the parents. He's a product of an all black. He's a product of what a black power worked because it did in my case. Um, I'm from one of the most, you know, strongest cities for opportunity for black people still have a tremendous wealth gap, still the same as any other city in the United States in terms of 
fairness and equity needing to be more of a priority. But in terms of opportunity to, to make something of yourself, you're not going to find me every place on earth. So I grew up with a very unique experience of being competent, of being confident, and being confident of my competence and not feeling secondary. Well, let me just say that I think that one of the reasons we created this PBS show is to get the world that knows you in one way to know you in another. Yeah. 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 And I think episode by episode, I think we're accomplishing that. And I feel like a lot of people in America can, can see this now and appreciate it. I want to ask you one more thing. Yeah. And then I'm always so grateful for your time. Yeah. You're going to tell everybody one work of art. Uh, it, it could be a song. It could be a book. It could be a play. It could be a movie or anything that you think if everyone on the earth had the experience of this, that it might do the world good. So there's a book called Ruins of Empires that people should read. There's a guy named, there's a French guy named Count Volney. Right? He was a scholar. He's a world traveler. This is 1791 what this man understood in 1791 by Francis Count Volney Stoller, world traveler, confident of Benjamin Franklin. We know that guy in this country and an aristocrat of pronounced Republican symphonies, symphonies in Egypt. He had seen an age old monument in temples lie half buried in the sand and had pondered the meaning of civilization, the rise and its fall reflections that gave free reign to this ruins of empires. Now, what he's saying is here is I'm looking at a civilization. It's like the end of the Planet of the Apes when Charlton Heston sees the Statue of Liberty sticking out on the beach. He's like, oh, shit, there was something here, but we were here and we managed to mess this up. So this is him looking at that, just to put that visual. And he says, how is it, he mused, that a people now forgotten discover others were yet barbarians the elements of the arts and sciences, a race of men now rejected from society for their sable skin and fizzled hair, founded on the study of the laws of nature, those civil and religious systems which still govern the universe. I remember reading that as a kid, and I, don't, I didn't feel compelled to prove to anybody Egypt was black. I didn't feel compelled to make you see it my way. I understood that someone who was an eyewitness saw that. And saw through common sense that, oh, wow, these people that have fallen so far from great. So as I looked for myself in the Abrahamic religion, as I looked for myself in different sects and religious cults, and as I looked for myself in different academia and speeches, what I understood and had to understand is what Chanta Diop wanted us to understand and what Dr. John Henry Clark wanted us to understand, that being black does not innately make you special. Being Earth's original people does not make you a chosen people because God is not a bigot. What you are is the first people to have done all this shit before. You've built empires. You've mastered human education, health systems. You've done that. And somewhere we dropped the ball. And somewhere the ultimate lesson is in regaining your place on the world stage and in world history. How do you ensure not to let the people who currently have the ball drop it? Because if it can be dropped by us and we built pyramids out of space, definitely dudes who just build in a couple of spaceships and the skyscrapers are going to drop the ball. But if we as humans start to understand the only reason I'm black and you're white is because along the line, some people left Africa, some people did. My people stayed closer to the equator. Your people made it to further up north. We are simply human beings. We're simply, whether we're brown or pink or white or light of skin, we are simply beings that are put here by a grand creator. And it's, as much as we marvel in song and as much as we marvel in dance and as much as we marvel in sculpture and art, the most beautiful piece of art ever created is the one we see when we look at one another. Because God has put us here. That's simple. And I hope that people would leave more willing to see God in each, in each other so that we can't mistreat one another. That's the best I got. You have once again brought a smile to my face. And the reason that we call our PBS show Love and Respect is because whenever, whenever you, it's not just with me, but whenever you end a phone call, you will say love and respect yeah. to others and have a day. Absolutely. 
And so, Michael, as always, I thank you very much and love and respect to you. Man, love and respect you immensely, brother. Have a great day. And now the sermonette in my homily opinion. I met Keller Mike when he first appeared on HBO's Real Time. One of my producing joys was prepping guests for a demanding one-hour live show before a studio audience. I was delighted that Michael had thoughtfully considered each topic to be discussed that night, and at showtime he lived up to his stage name and killed it. On his return appearance a year later, he answered my knock on his dressing room door with one arm in a cast, he explained with a smile, I can't fight, but I can still hug. As we laughed and hugged, I thought, here's a talent who someday I'd like to produce. He'd be an amiable alpha male Oprah. Later we discovered that we share a birthday appropriately given his recreational pursuits. It's 420. In today's interview, I loved his calling Killer Mike an amazing character, quote, created by a kid named Michael Render to exercise his love of hip-hop, which he described as badass, pugilistic poetry about the desire to win. Michael Render, though, he continued, is somebody who the world doesn't really know. Well, the world's now getting a chance through two complementary projects. The first is the solo album Michael that drops today, June 16th. Its songs chronicle a son of the South who, in his words, quote, grew up with a very unique experience of being confident in my competence and not feeling secondary. That confidence beams on the album's cover of a nine-year-old Michael crowned with a halo. The songs include tales of a young man's mistakes, regrets, and loss. This artist has evolved beyond a desire to win. He's learned that bearing one's soul displays a bravery that tops braggadocio and bravado. The second project is the PBS show we've co-created and produced, Love and Respect with Killer Mike. On it, Michael puts a hip-hop update on public TV shows that shaped him, Mr. Rogers, Sesame Street, and Reading Rainbow. The title, Love and Respect, holds our feet to the fire to present the best of ourselves, to inspire the best in viewers, that all may have confidence in their competence and never feel secondary. No pugilism here, just compassion and humor. We don't fight, we hug. If you agree that that's what the world needs more of, email me at yegodspodcast at gmail.com and review us at Apple Podcasts. Now, until next time, this is Scott Carter. Be of good cheer.